Maybe okay. not something else. Okay. So, um, hello everyone. Today we have with us a brilliant researcher, Ankit. Ankit finished his master's from ETH Zurich, focusing on computer vision and machine learning. He has an awesome research experience of Triple IT Hyderabad, University of Freiburg, US, UC Santa Cruz, Stanford. He has also presented research at CVPR, ICRA, IROS, and IV. So we look forward to your talk. We are going to discuss paper, uh, butterflies in hyperbolic space. So yeah, okay, I guess we should, uh, we should start. Yeah, uh, hello everyone. So uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me. I think it's, it's super cool to uh, share what I worked on and it's exciting to see that people are interested in it. So thanks again for inviting me to the talk. Okay, so the main idea as, as introduced, it's about learning representations for images where you have a hierarchy in the labels. And of course, I would come, come back to the title at a later moment where I say that the butterflies are in the hyperbolic space and what this exactly means. So you would have to be a bit patient for that to reveal itself, but bear with me and then we will come to that soon. Uh, and this work was, uh, done with Professor Andreas Strause, uh, Anastasia, uh, Octavian, and Dario. Yeah, and just, yeah, already introduced, um, but just to briefly summarize, so I was uh, working uh, before, before my master's, I was doing some research at Triple IT Hyderabad, where I worked on uh, LiDAR camera calibration, and then also some uh, research experience at University of Freiburg in Germany. Again, working on robotics. That was actually my proper first proper research uh, internship slash work. And then of course I had the really cool opportunity to work uh, at Newtonomy, now Emotional in Singapore. And the best part of it was to have this, this experience to present uh, work that I did in these projects at ICRA and IROS, the robotics conferences, IV, and of course CVPR. And yeah, I think most before 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 I started on this project that I'm presenting today, I was working or focusing mostly on autonomous driving research. Uh, also at Triple IT Hyderabad, it, that was kind of like the beginning, and then also at Freiburg, kind of in the similar direction. And then when I was at ETH, I was just a common student, but the driverless project. Uh, at AMZ and yeah, I think it was quite interesting, but then I realized that, yeah, I was, I was wanting to do something different and I thought maybe I should do my, do the next project in something, something else. And this is exactly how this project, like we decided that, okay, I would work on this, something away from, you know, autonomous driving. And I, I have spent some time to contribute to the open source and yeah, I also finished a half marathon in under two hours. So I'm, I'm quite proud of that achievement. Okay, so now let's get to the, to the crux of this, this evening. So I would be discussing, um, as an outline, I would be discussing two types of models, CNN-based models and embedding-based models. And they would be respectively the first and the second half of my talk. So of course, like for the CNN-based models, the general idea is, when you're training an image classifier, you are training mostly, or generally they are trained on image label pairs. And the question that we ask is, can we leverage or can we use something more than the image label pairs? Can we leverage the interlabel interactions and outperform a traditionally trained CNN model that only is trained on the signal obtained between the error of the image and its ground truth label? So can we do something more? Can we extract something more out of stuff that we already know. So we discussed the approaches uh, to inject the label hierarchy information, but at different levels of abstraction. And the good thing about this is, or what I find interesting is that you can uh, have them or you can apply these to an arbitrary or a generic CNN model. So it doesn't have to be very specific. It can be your favorite CNN model from your favorite library. And you can just plug in these losses that we that I will discuss here. And that's the cool thing. So the idea was not to focus too much on, 
you know, developing a particular layer in the network or having like a particular, you know, special um, feature extraction procedure, but rather just something more generic. And in the second half, we discussed embedding based models. And more specifically here, it's about order preservation rather than distance, distance preservation, which is generally the case in when one, you know, talks about embeddings. And the main idea is that the order learning embeddings here, they produce a more faithful representation when the data is hierarchical in nature. So if it's ar arranged in a hierarchy, you would have a really nice representation when you, you know, embed them preserving embeddings as compared to, you know, normal distance preserving embeddings, which look at the physical proximity. And I will discuss later, what are these order preserving embeddings and what do they mean? And what does the embedding space look like? And um, then of course we show how we can do this. Yes. So Ankita, I had this question. Can we use this uh, yeah. linear image embedding concept for videos also? Because we are eventually splitting up into frames. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I think as long as you have this hierarchy, you can use what I will discuss today. Or like the main idea is that you kind of have this hierarchy and you can use this hierarchical information to somehow, you know, guide your model better to learn better representations. So in the end, in our case, we have images, but you could imagine a case where you have videos or maybe you also have some other abstract object. As long as you can make like, you can pass it through a function to get an embedding. So as long as you have a function that maps this arbitrary object to a vector that's representing this object in a meaningful way, then you can basically use these methods. And that's the idea. Right, thanks. Yeah, and also another thing to point out, which I will also mention later, is that these order preserving embeddings, they are used in the context of NLP. So like to learn entailment relations because those are asymmetric relations. And now we try to see if we can actually use them for the task of computer vision and if they actually work well in our image scenario. So yeah, coming back. So we show how Euclidean and non-Euclidean order preserving embeddings can be used to embed the images and the labels in a joint space. So the embeddings and the labels will live in the same space. And then that can help us to, you know, infer about an image and the label in a more coherent manner. And then these can be used to perform image classification in a way that is closer to what a human would do. And it would, it would basically improve interpretability of the model. <clears throat> and finally, to close, we compared these embedding based approaches with the CNN based approaches under uniform settings. And we are able to show empirically that the label hierarchy information does indeed improve over a hierarchy. So a bit, bit about the background and why, why I talk about butterflies. So uh, the project was basically conceived at the national science collection here at ETH in Zurich. And here at ETH, we have one natural science collection. And of course, there are a lot of other natural science collections around the world, maybe in museums and other institutions. And these collections have, you can imagine, they have millions of specimens donated primarily by hobbyists or, you know, amateur collectors. And here specifically at ETH, when a new batch of specimens arrive, they are around almost 40,000 newly added every year. And the main the main uh, way of pro proceeding with this is that they look at the specimens and they are then given to specialists who can you know help classify that okay this is a this is the species of this particular butterfly or if we have another specimen this is the family or the subfamily and so on but the main issue is that with time the specialists are kind of the number of people who know about these species are kind of reducing and this makes it very hard to find them, manage the time. And they are also usually like expensive to hire because they are very few and they're like real experts in the field and there are very few of them. So the idea was we would like to create an automated way to pre-sort these images that save both time and money. So a bit about how this whole project was based around. We had around 50,000 images from the collection, but of course, like the collection has around more than 200,000 images. So we, we were just looking at a subset of these 50,000 images. 
of these butterflies and uh, they they come with a four level label hierarchy so every image is associated with four labels so you have a family which is like the top of the hierarchy then you have a subfamily which is the next level then you have and finally at the bottom you have the species so these are the four labels like four levels of labels that are associated with every image so you can see some samples from the data set here at the bottom and throughout the presentation i will be using uh, these colored coding here so you have the skin representing the family the magenta representing the subfamily the yellow representing the genus and the black representing the species so this is what it would look like if you would you know just look at the label hierarchy itself so there's no images when i visualize it it's just a label hierarchy and for clarity i have just i have omitted the last level of the label hierarchy because it becomes very cluttered so i'm just showing the top 3 out of the four levels in the label hierarchy and you can see that this was this is a taxonomy so it's created by experts and it does it not only contains semantic information but also it might contain you know more peculiar information about maybe the origin or the geography of a particular species where it comes from and it can also contain like really interesting things or they are named usually based on okay maybe this this particular species it is it eats a citrus plant or that's the host of this species or this particular species has wings that are scaly and you know that's how they create we have to kind of see that there's more than just visual information here and there is like another added dimension other than the visual information and there is this part of this you know semantic information that is hiding or that is you know somehow encoded in this taxonomy tree oops yeah so here is another way of looking at this uh, the data and this is basically now let's put the table and you can see that in addition to the imbalance that we see here so here you see right the degree of every node is very different it's there's a lot of variance there are some nodes that have like maybe two or three like outgoing or incoming nodes but there are others that have like maybe 100 200 so there is a huge imbalance in the way the trees form but also there's in addition there is also imbalance in the way the images are distributed across the labels and this is very skewed so you can see that you know for all the four labels for all the four levels and their labels we have this uh, you know long tail distribution and again the idea is that we would we hypothesize that you know using the hierarchy we would be able to build in like a better representation learning mechanism in this in the models that we have and hopefully we would like to improve performance which in our case is you know performance on the classification task so coming to the motivation again i mentioned before very often in traditional classifiers you are only using information about the image and the label pairs so you have the image on which you extract features and then you have label pairs as ground truth and you use them to train a classifier and our question what we try to ask is is there a way that we can exploit this hierarchy and we try to explore and evaluate different methods of you know passing this hierarchical information to the classifier to the image classifier for example yeah you know if you have images here you have label pairs and that's what we use traditionally what we try to question is you know if we know that this these labels are actually arranged in the form of a hierarchy or maybe you know you can say in other words as a tree and that's right exploit or extract some information out of it so it could be information about the levels in the hierarchy or it could be uh, you know some in edge relations and that is the basic idea to you know see different ways and different abstractions in which we can exploit this information um i would like to intervene in between first thing your voice is lagging a little bit mm -hmm. like um there's some issue on the internet connectivity i guess and uh, okay. second thing uh when you're talking about the hierarchy thing if i want to understand it in a very raw manner can we try to uh, group it like we are trying to classify between vegetables and fruits and between fruits we have different kinds of fruits and within vegetables we have different kinds of vegetable so we are trying to establish a hierarchy between that sort of thing right yeah exactly so for example if you have 
you know, if you have fruits, you have an orange, which is a fruit. So the orange would be like in the lower level because it's more specific and fruit is a more, you know, more abstract concept. When you say that orange is a fruit, the fruit is like the parent and the orange is like the child of this fruit. And you can say also that maybe apple is a fruit and then apple would be another child of the fruit concept. Right. Okay. Thank you. And that is completely different. So let's say you have a vehicle and there you can have a car or you can have a bus and that's completely different. So they are, you know, they are belonging to different things. And then of course you can have, you can imagine this, you know, completely like the top of the hierarchy, which is just a thing. So it can be anything, right? In our case, it's not fruits or vehicles or things, but more specifically it's butterflies. Right. But yes, you can imagine it like that. Okay, understood. Thank you. So, I mean, as I mentioned here, you see that there is this this uh, imbalance, and we would somehow like to share information between the images from the unbalanced or like from the imbalanced data. And here you can take like a toy example. So let's say there are some or there's a bunch of images that have or a bunch of labels that have very few images associated with them. So for example, here, maybe it's one of the images here or from here. So they have very little images for this particular label. And there are some other images that have, you know, more images because maybe there are more specimens from them. Maybe they are more commonly found and so on and so forth for various reasons that you can imagine. And you see that we would somehow like, like the model to share this information. And we try to use the hierarchy to kind of like ground the model into sharing the information between different different labels. So we know that, of course, they are different labels. This one and this one here on the right are different. We know that they are the same family or maybe they belong to the same subfamily. And we would like to exploit this information. And this would probably help us where we have like, you know, this imbalanced data. And finally, there is this part in the motive where we think that, you know, we want to jointly infer the visual cues from the images, of course, and the semantics from the label hierarchy. And generally, if you think about it, again, it's a case where we are mostly focused on the visual, uh, like the visual cues that we get from a CNN or whatever model that you like. And we kind of skip on, or we might miss the semantic cues. Here, for example, if you look at this uh, montage here, you see that the if you can imagine the embeddings of the orange here and the clock here would be very similar because they they have the same color and they look similar in terms of the shape. But of course, we as humans know that, okay, an orange and a clock are very different semantically, right? It's, just, it's the same thing like what we were discussing before. They are semantically very different objects and even though they look visually similar, they kind of are not. Like they are semantically different. So of course the embeddings should not just rely on the visual cues, but also the semantics. Here again, if you look at the clock, which is like a counter example, they look very different or they look different from each other, but in the end, we know that they are very similar. So that's the basic idea, that you wanna also include information that you can from this taxonomy on top of the visual cues that you get from the image, of course. So there has been some work that we, that I would like to discuss before like getting into the details of our method. And most of the embedding based models, especially the order preserving models to learn, you know, more meaningful representations, they have been widely used for NLP. And the main idea of order preserving is to model asymmetric relations that can capture, you know, entailment relations where an entailment relation is something which captures and is a concept. So for example, an orange is a fruit. So that is an entailment or if you say that a queen is a woman, so that is an entailment relation. Recently, works have also proposed to, you know, have these model parameters live in non-Euclidean geometry or live in non-Euclidean embedding spaces to improve performance. And finally, these images in our case, which are with the labels arranged as a tree in this hierarchy, which is a tree in our case, we can extend this by adding images to the graph and learn asymmetric relations on top of this. And that's what we will show. And of course, there have been some embedding based models for images, but most of them, them have been used for, you know, tasks at the intersection of natural language processing and computer vision, or maybe, you know, if you have zero shot learning and 
also recently there was this hyper hyperbolic image embeddings work that was trying to you know learn non euclidean representations for images and they were using for characters from different languages and trying to cluster them to see which languages have similar characters and so on and finally you have the more common type that we are used to or that we generally know about which is cnn based models for you know image classification or things and most of them in at least when you have uh, multiple labels for images they are using a common cnn to extract the features or the backbone and they use level specific label prediction network so they would have like a common feature and they have like in our case they would have four different cnns that predict the label for each level something like that so our focus again is we try not to modify the cnn but have a more general set of methods that can be applied to you know a more generic classifier and not, not very specific in terms of uh, you know a particular layer or something but something that can be used more more generally so like i mentioned before we can divide them into two categories that we discuss here the first are the cnn based methods and in the second half we would discuss the embedding based methods so first i'll come to the cnn based methods and the main idea here is we discuss about five of these and the first one is like a baseline which is hierarchy agnostic so it doesn't really care about the hierarchy and the idea here is with every method that i will show you we kind of increase the amount of information that is available to the to the classifier or to the model about the label hierarchy so for example here you can exploit the label hierarchy in different levels of abstraction so you can use the number of levels that you have in the hierarchy as one thing then you can go a step further and say okay maybe we should also not just talk about the number of levels but also how different concepts are connected to each other so you could use the edge information and finally you could go even one step further and say maybe i should not just look at you know two different nodes and a connecting edge but maybe i should just look at a whole subtree in this graph or in this hierarchy and try to exploit this or use that to you know model learn better so you see here as we go we will kind of include more information in different levels of abstraction so before i go into the details of the of the ways we do it just a quick experimental setup so we use rgb images and we uh, i would just denote f here which is just a cnn that takes an image and it will output like a representation for it and then we have like logits for all of these and finally of course as before every image is associated with four labels so you have a family you have a subfamily you have a genus and species in that order of you know becoming more and more specific where the family is the most abstract and the species are the most specific part and as a last generally you could do entropy for each level unless specified and we use precision recall and f1 score for each label and because we are we are kind of uh, functioning in this uh, multi label regime we use uh, average scores so we use micro and macro average glo global scores just to give a quick <coughs> yeah, here you can see a macro for example you can also do it for, for all of them but here i have macro precision so macro precision would basically be calculated by just taking an average over all the precisions for the labels that you have on the other hand the micro precision would be calculated by you know kind of agglomerating the elements of the metric and then calculating the metric and that's that's the basic difference it's just a small detail but yeah I'd just like to point out so coming to the first uh, method is just a hierarchy agnostic classifier it's a baseline and this classifier is indifferent to the presence of the label hierarchy so for example here you see you pass the image to the cnn and if this hierarchy so if you had in this toy hierarchy we have three levels we have l1 with two two nodes l2 with uh, four concepts and ln or l3 with eight concepts this classifier would basically you know ignore the tree so we would just flatten the whole thing which would look something like this and then the idea would be that the classifier just predicts as many labels as it wants as many la labels as it likes so if you give it an image 
it would predict for every label whether this image belongs to this label or not. And it can predict as many labels as it wants. So this is like hierarchy agnostic. It does not look at the hierarchy. It just ignores the hierarchy. It just flattens it and doesn't care about how things are connected and what is where. And of course, this is the most naive way to do it and exactly why this is our baseline. Then the first thing that would come to one mind is, can we exploit, what is the first thing that we can exploit? And here we see that since we know that, you know, our hierarchy has exactly four levels, we can exploit this. So we can exploit the fact that we have exactly N levels in our hierarchy. And instead of predicting, letting the network or the model predict as many labels as it wants, we let it predict a label for every level. So basically you have three levels here, you would take the max of this one, you would take the arg max of the second level, you would take max over the last level, and you would have three labels. Then you can say, oh, but what about, you know, using some more information, not just the number of levels in the label hierarchy, but maybe also some subtree relations about it. So this has a similar structure as the previous one. But in addition to this, we hypothesize that the upper levels are predicted more accurately than the lower levels. And we also later, as I will show you, we also observe it to be true empirically. And the main, like the main intuition behind this, or the main idea is that because in the upper levels, we have fewer labels and each of these labels has a lot of images as compared to the lower levels. We hypothesize that the upper levels will perform better. And of course, they, as empirically shown, they do. And then what we do is we mask the implausible nodes before making the prediction for the downstream level. So for example, if you look at this model here, let's say we gave it an image and it this as the family label for the image. Then we know that if this is, if, if this prediction is true, then these two are the only plausible subfamilies because that's how the taxonomy is defined. Like if you say that this image is a fruit, of course, you cannot say that this image is also a car, because a car is not a fruit, right? So that's exactly what's happening here. You would like to mask everything that's implausible given the prediction in the upper level. And that's how you go downstream. So once you predict this blue node here, which is shown here, you are only looking at the labels that are the children that are plausible given that this prediction is correct. And then you say, okay, you predict this one, then you go, when you go downstream, you only pick the one that are the, of the one that you predicted because all the others are implausible. And this is the idea. So here we kind of exploit like this sub relation. Only plausible nodes are kept and the implausible nodes or implausible labels are just, you know, masked out. And then we have this other method where we can look at it, but in a different way. So, so in the previous one, you can kind of imagine it as going from like trickling from the top, going down to the bottom. And in the next one, imagine it starting from the bottom and going all the way up. So it's like a top down versus a bottom up approach. And here you see it's a bottom up. Here, instead of predicting like, you know, logics for every level, we just predict a probability distribution over the final level. And then to get the probability of the upper level, we can just sum up the probability of the children. So if, if you have a node here, the probability of this, one or this label, you would just sum up the probabilities of the children and you would get the probability of this label. And you can do this for all the labels and you would have a valid probability distribution level. And why is that? Well, that is because the probability distribution in the, in the, on the leaves was a probability. If you sum it up, you are marginalizing and it would still be a valid probability distribution. So this is like another way of thinking the previous one where we go from from the top to bottom and here you go from the bottom to the top. And then finally we look at this hierarchical softmax, which is a bit, it's a bit of a different or a twist on the way we kind of look at the probability. So instead of looking at them more independently, we look at, look at them as conditional probability. So instead of the CNN predicting the probability of subfamily S1, we are actually interpreting this as the probability of subfamily one given that f1 is true so this is like a conditional probability so it's the probability of the ith child given the parent is true and the cool thing about this is that it's implicit implicit information about the upper levels 
and you only need to compute the loss over over the leads. And I think it's it, it's quite interesting take on how we can incorporate the hierarchical information. So for all the CNN methods, we look at how actually, uh, yeah, like once we have these, how how do they perform against each other? So we just look at the experiments and I'm just showing like the major part of it. Of course, you can look at the, the related material to see more details, but here you see that uh, we empirically see that the that exploiting the label hierarchy information yields better performance. So if you look at the baseline here and you compare it to all the other that kind of exploit the hierarchy in different ways, they're always outperforming this uh, hierarchy agnostic classifier. You also see the uh, level wise performance for the best performing model at the bottom here. And here you can see that there is high performance in the upper levels as we hypothesized before, which is, which is good. And this is already quite nice if you are a natural science collection or a museum, because if you need to identify or, you know, segregate or classify these butterflies, they are usually hiring experts for every family. And if the, if the performance of the upper levels or the family level is quite good, then you can already, you know, pre-sort it. And then this whole task can be, you know, expedited and made faster and more economical. So you can already see that even if you, were to only trust like the upper level predictions, they are already quite good. And they already, give us, you know, uh, they already do a pre-sorting for you. So making your task easier, the task that we are trying to solve for the, you know, natural science collections here. So that was the first part. And in the second part now, Sorry. So in the second part, we would use uh, embedding inspired from NLP and experiment with them to see if they can be used for images or in the context of computer vision as well. And I will divide this second half again into two parts. First, we, you know, explain a framework where we can, we just do it for the label hierarchy only. And once we see how that is, how we go about it, we can add images to this label hierarchy and then do it jointly for the label hierarchy and the images without changing much of the whole procedure. So first I will focus on the label hierarchy embedding only. So there are no images involved in this first half here. That is. So before again, going into the details, I would like to stress the fact that we focus on order preserving embeddings. And the main idea is that these order preserving embeddings, they, they have been used to encode asymmetric relations and embed directed graphs from natural language. And we try to extend them to a tree with the label hierarchy and images and jointly embed these. So the first thing of course comes to mind is what exactly are these order preserving embeddings? Well, unlike distance preserving embeddings that we normally speak of when we say embeddings, that captures the notion of physical proximity. So when I say physical proximity, let's say, you know, your L1 distance or your L2 distance, so looking at just the physical proximity, like we do when we say distance preserving embeddings, the order preserving embeddings, on the other hand, they capture entailment or the is a relation. So if orange is a fruit, these embeddings capture that. So you can imagine here, if you look at V, so let's say V is the concept maybe an orange and this other red dot is an apple and this is a banana. So if you see you is a fruit and everything that's a fruit should lie in, in the embedding space that is owned by the parent you. So if, if there are fruits, they should all lie within the embedding space that is owned by the concept fruit. And you can imagine the same here for the green one. And I will discuss this of course in detail. And the main idea is that we want to treat the label hierarchy that we have with the images as a directed acyclic graph or more specifically as a tree. And then, you know, here the directed edges are asymmetric relations, which are captured very well with order prism. That's exactly what we want to do. So we, we, we look at order embedding, which is one type of order preserving embeddings. And then we look at Euclidean cones, which is a more generalized version of order embeddings. And finally, we lift these Euclidean cones into the hyperbolic space for reasons that will become evident as I present. And then we use these three embeddings 
these three order, order preserving embeddings to embed the label hierarchy jointly with the images and finally classification. So yeah, coming back to the main types of embeddings that we use. So the first is the order embeddings and the second is the codes which are used for Euclidean and hyperbolic space. So first let's look at the order embedding which are depicted by this figure here. So here, if for a given pair of concepts, U and V, if U entails V, or in other words, if V is a subconcept of U, so if this guy is a subconcept of U, then V follow the area that is owned by U. And in, in the order embeddings case, this area is defined by an orthant or a quadrant that originates at U. So for, for any embedding here, the space that is owned by this embedding is everything that is inside this shaded area that's in this uh, point that is originating at U. And we can you know, def define this energy that kind of captures this behavior. The main disadvantages of the order embeddings are that they are heavy cone intersections. So for example, here you see that if there were two different concepts, let's say this, the U here or the one is fruits and here are all the fruits. And this green one is vehicle. So here is a bus and a car. But you see that, of course, there is an area that is kind of overlapping. And we don't really want that because we know that a vehicle and a fruit are completely different. They are completely different concepts. But there is, of course, this you know intersecting area. There is this heavy intersecting area. And anything that lies there is kind of ambiguous. And we want to avoid that. So how can we actually do it? Well, we can generalize this. And this is the entailment. So again, for a given pair of concepts U and V, if U entails V, or in other words, if V is a subconcept of U, then V should be region that is owned by U. And here, this region is defined instead of a quadrant, as in the previous case. Here, it is defined by a cone. And this is more flexible because here you don't have this constraint that the angle is supposed to be perpendicular or it has to be 90 degrees here. You see the angle here, it can be flex, flexible. So this makes it, makes the method more scalable. And also what you can see is that they are defined in such a way that the cones can move in all directions and basically increase the model's capacity. Another thing to note is that embeddings that are closer to the origin are, they have a larger, or larger cone angle or they have a larger area because of course the closer you are to the origin the more abstract you are and that basically means that you probably have a lot of subconcepts that belong to you and you probably need a larger space to have these subconcepts live harmoniously let's say and as and when you go down this this hierarchy and you go you know you can imagine this as a nested cone inside another cone in another cone and the more you go in you see the angles kind of reduce and this is basically coming from the fact that the ones that are closer to the origin are, you know, they are more abstract, implying that they are probably having a lot of concepts that are their own subconcepts and they need the space to, you know, embed these. And same as before, you have an energy here, here instead of, you know, having it in terms of the direct, you know, difference between the embeddings here, it's formulated as a as an angle. So basically it would mean that it's falling within the right area if, if the angle here is smaller than the angle of the parent. So if the if the if V is falling within the cone U, then it's good. Then we are good. Everything is fine. We can move on to the next thing. So that's that's the basic idea. So how do we actually do it? So first, we only do the embeddings for the label hierarchy only. We treat the label hierarchy as a DAG. In our case, it's a tree which is also a DAG, which is the type of a DAG. And a directed edge U, V symbolizes, again, the same concept, that V is a subconcept of U. And then what we can do is in the second part, we have also the images for embedding the images together. We add the images at the bottom of this graph that we already had, which came from the hierarchy. So we add the images at the bottom. And what we do is we can connect the images to the label associated with it from the last level in the label hierarchy. And once we have this, we have a joint embedding space where we have both the images and the labels living together. 
and this can be used to classify. So when we get a new image, we can see where it falls within this space and then look at the cones that it belongs to. And that will basically give us the label that is the one for this particular embedding. Important thing to note here is that the images are as the leaves in this tree because the upper upper nodes are more abstract. And that's the, that's the concept you want to capture because you know, like the upper nodes are the family, the subfamily, the genus, and the species. If I come down from the more abstract nodes to the more specific nodes, and we we say that the images are more are more specific, and we attach them to the leaves of the of this hierarchy. So the experimental setup looks something like this. So we have we would like to classify the positive and the negative edges from the DAG that come from the hierarchy, of course, and where are the positive edges coming from? Well, the positive edges come from the DAG itself. So if we had the hierarchy, this would be the positive edges. And then one might ask, what are the negative edges? Well, the negative edges can be con constructed as follows. So you take your fully connected digraph without self loops. Then you remove all the edges that you have in your original hierarchy and everything that you have left are the negative edges. And then what you do is you compute this function which is a function of the positive and the negative edges. And this is basically saying that, okay, we would like to have a margin that should, that should be used to separate positive and negative concepts that are not related to each other. And these are the energies that we discussed before. So depending on what type of embedding space you're looking at, whether it's order embeddings or if it's the cones, you would change the energy function. But in the end, you use the same loss function and then for the metrics, we compute uh, the true positive rate and the true negative rate. And on top, we also compute a full F1 score because we want to also check for the reconstruction capabilities of our embeddings. So now we look at how these label hierarchy look like. So this is on the right for your reference. This is the graph that we sh that I showed you before. So this is the uh, first three levels of the of the label hierarchy that we have when just visualized. And here you can see how the labels are embedded, how the concepts are embedded when you look at 2D order embeddings for our data set. So you can see again, you see that quadrant like structure where everything that is a sub concept is, you know, supposed to fall ideally within this quadrant that is owned by the parent. And here you can see again, the sign represents the family, the magenta represents the subfamily and the yellow is the genus. And you can look at the evolution of uh, these quadrant embeddings. And you can see, of course, the cones that are in blue, except on a part of it, but you can see that there's a lot of intersections between the regions that are owned by different labels. And we don't really want that. We have some entanglement. And this is exactly what the Euclidean cones do. So they bring this more flexibility in our representations. And here you can see it's kind of not having the constraint of, you know, having this ortho orthogonality and you don't really need a full quadrant based on how much space is required by an embedding, the angle of the cone can expand or contract. And this is exactly what's happening here. So you can see that we have a really nice disentanglement and everything is kind of separate. So if you look at the evolution of these, the label embeddings, you see that quickly the, the cones are able to disentangle quickly with negligible intersections, making them more space efficient and also the representations more meaningful. And now we finally come to the part where we move these butterflies from, uh, you know, Euclidean space and lift them into hyperbolic space. So these, this is what a hyperbolic space, uh, you know, it's visualized in multiple ways. There were also some artists that visualized it like this. So you can kind of imagine that what we would do is now, instead of the model parameters living in Euclidean space, we would like to move them so that they live in this hyperbolic space. And this would basically like to take advantage of the hyperbolic geometry. 
Now, of course, the first question that one would have is like, why do you want to go to, to this hyperbolic geometry? Why are we not happy with, you know, working in Euclidean geometry? And well, the answer is that the volume of a ball grows exponentially with the radius in hyperbolic space, while in Euclidean space, it's only growing polynomially. So if you have a sphere in three dimensional, you know, the volume is proportional to R cube or it's proportional to the uh, proportional only polynomially to the radius, but in hyperbolic space, it's exponentially related to the radius. And this is kind of very, very nice if you want to embed something that has a tree-like structure, which is exactly what we have in our case. Our label hierarchy and the images at the bottom are exactly a tree. And you can consider them as nodes in a tree. And this property of, you know, this exponential property is very similar to that when you have, of when you have a tree where the nodes in a tree with height h and branching factor b are also proportional or they are related in an exponential manner. And this is the basic idea. That's why we want to lift our cones from Euclid into hyperbolic spaces. You can kind of say, and you can even notice that, you know, this can be considered as a continuous analog of a tree. Embedding in the hyperbolic space can be considered as a continuous analog of a tree in, you know, when we talk about a tree in discrete mathematics. So coming to the optimization part, here you can see that if you have a normal embedding living in Euclidean space, usually when your parameters live in Euclidean space, they can be optimized using SGD. But the thing is, when your models are living in non-Euclidean space, you need to uh, calculate the Riemannian gradient, which is the Euclidean gradient scale by the inverse of the metric tensor, as you can see here. And then of course, to perform the update, you would uh, use the exponential math to project the gradient uh, from the tangent space uh, here I'm sorry. onto the uh, hyperbolic can space. Just, um, can, you uh, can you clarify a little more on the advantage of using RSGD? Yes, so the, the thing here is that if you were to differentiate and you have your parameters living in Euclidean space, you would have a normal, you would have your vanilla stochastic gradient descent, right? right. But now the thing is that your, your parameters are not living in Euclidean space. They are living in hyperbolic space, which is non-Euclidean. And then you need to go to something more general, which is the Riemannian gradient. And you compute the Riemannian gradient of this, which is the right way. Like when you differentiate, you would get this. That is the difference. So when I say Riemannian SGD or RSGD, it's basically doing the right thing when your parameters are living in hyperbolic space. Okay. So uh, RSGD is specific to the hyperbolic space case. Well, not really. It depends. You can have, you can have, a, you know, you can have different curvatures. So it's not specific to hyperbolic space, but it's just it's more common, it's more general. And you know, hyperbolic space is one case. So if you go to spherical spaces, you would also use the same, but then the way you, like the formulation would change because the curvature changes. Right, right. So Understood. that would change, but in the end, it's more, more a general, general way of computing the gradient. And since we are kind of not having our parameters live in this Euclidean space, using the, you know, normal gradient that we use would be incorrect. So we use, the Riemannian gradient, which is the correct version of the gradient. Okay. And then these are the update rules. You know, these are the updates that you use to update your parameter U. Right, understood. Thank you. Right, understood. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. So we use the exponential map to uh, perform the update for the parameter. And now you see that the performance improvement offered by changing the geometry use. We observed that the Euclidean cones perform better than the order embeddings. Of, of course, both of them are in Euclidean space, we have to remember. But you see that the hyperbolic cones, even in dimensions as low as 100, have almost twice as better performance than the Euclidean counterparts. So it's, it's quite interesting to see that, yes, indeed, changing the geometry does improve performance. Now, now that we have kind of looked at the results and that you know it makes sense to have this hyperbolic uh, geometry we can now move where we embed together the label hierarchy and the images in this joint space. So now, of course, for the label hierarchy, we do exactly the same as before, but now 
the question is how do we bring the images to live in the same space as the label hierarchy? And it's quite straightforward or well, it's quite simple how you can do it. You take an image I and you pass it through the CNN and you get some of its, you get its representation or embedding. And this is basically coming from a CNN that is frozen. So you don't really train on the parameters of the CNN. And then you have a learnable matrix W, which is basically once you get the representation that comes out from the CNN, from the frozen CNN, you just multiply a matrix with it. And this transforms, this linear transform transforms it from, transforms it to the same space where the, to the D-dimensional space where the labels are living. And the label embeddings are again living in the same space. So now you have the image and the label embeddings living in the same space. The CNN here is frozen, so we don't train on its parameters. We don't change the parameters. The only thing that's learnable here is the matrix W. And then how would we classify a given image I? Well, you pass it through the CNN and you then multiply with W. And then of course, for every label that you have in a particular level, you take the one that minimizes the energy. So you return the label with the least violating energy. So let's say if you have an image of an orange and you pass it through the CNN, you would get the energy of the orange of the image with, with the label orange. You would have the energy of the image with the, uh, with the label banana. You would have the energy of the image with the label car. And you take the one that is the least, the one with the least energy, you take that label. And that's how you classify the particular image I. And the loss, again, the good part about this is that it's exactly the same as before. There is no change here. We treat the embeddings. Once we have the embeddings, there's basically no difference. You can use exactly the same loss that we use only for when we were only embedding the label hierarchy, which is really nice. And we perform exactly the same optimization that I showed you before. That's quite cool. So in our case, we use Adam to learn W, the matrix, and also the embeddings for the labels. In reality, well, this is not that straightforward. The optimization was quite challenging in the fact that you don't not only have like a highly non-convex landscape, but also in this case, it's highly non-Euclidean. Then also the fact that, you know, you have objects of two different types. So you have images and labels or concepts. It becomes a bit more compounded, the problem. We were using the, the RSGD or the Riemannian SGD optimizer, which is accurate, but it's quite slow to converge. And we also tried a combination of the Adam and the RSGD together, but it was hard to manage it. And in the end, what we realized was if we use the Adam, which is a superior optimizer uh, compared to the SGD generally, we were okay with using the Adam where we were using an approximation. And we were still fine with it because Adam was just a better, better uh, optimizer compared to normal SGD. So this is what the space looks like in 2D when you visualize the hierarchy with the images. So here you have the family, the subfamily, and it kind of spaces out and you see the genus here in yellow. Then you have here the species and all the images are on the periphery, which form like the, like the radius of the circle kind of. They're you know, accumulating at the periphery. And this is what the, the embedding space jointly for the images and the label hierarchy look like. And now we can look at the empirical performance. So on the right, we show the graph reconstruction task, which is basically for the label hierarchy. But what we really care about is, or most importantly, we care about is the image classification, which is inside this blue rectangle. So you can see again that the hyperbolic cones outperform the Euclidean cones. And the key result here is that since it's the same metric and calculated in the same way, this performance, which, were, which we generated from embedding based models, they can be directly compared with CNN based image classifiers that we introduced in the first half. So now if you look at the combined, you know, like the mother of all tables, you see here that um, every model, whether it's CNN or an embedding based model is able to outperform the hierarchy agnostic baseline, which is the first one here, which basically does not consider or basically ignores the, the hierarchy information. The most inter interesting part is that 
even though the embeddings which are inspired from natural language and have only a matrix that is learnable here, the matrix W that I showed you before, they are able to offer really good competition to CNN based models. And the main thing again, they also outperform the hierarchy agnostic baseline, even without using, you know, the traditional classification style loss. So to conclude, uh, we exploit or we show how to exploit the label hierarchy knowledge. And in our case, we see that it's always a good idea and results in improved performance. We do this both for CNN based and order embed living in Euclidean and non-Euclidean space. Of course, order, order preserving embeddings mostly being used in the context of NLP. They really show a great uh, promise for computer vision when, you know, when your uh, data is lying in this hierarchical form. And finally, uh, we provide a reasonable model that can be used by, you know, natural science collections, or in our case, the entomological collection at ETH. They are also uh, now developing actively an app based on one of the models that, that I showed you today. And it's almost, almost ready to be deployed and uh, it would be available to uh, download by people who are hobbyists and who are collecting these specimens uh, you know, for as a part of their hobby, or also people who are more experts, more specifically, if it's a collection and they want to expedite this process, they can use the app uh, to kind of, um, you know, get really good, um, really, really accurate labels for at least the upper levels. Of course, it also gives the the labels for the lower levels, but it's kind of it's supposed to be taken with a pinch of salt because they might not be that correct. But at least for the upper level, you have really good, uh, good accuracy. And I think that's really cool. It's really cool to see how within almost like less than 12 months, you go from, you know, having a problem and then you kind of, you know, look at all the information that they have at the, at the collection, you take all the images, you rate them together, make like a kind of a data set out of it, then start to work on these models in the form of like research and try something that's not directly used in the context of computer vision and then you know you 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 just see more and you learn more and then once you're done with your research problem it's not the end of the you know it's not the end of the story there they're they're also trying to deploy it so it's also being deployed and uh, being used to actually um have a more more um you know have a wider impact than just being a research problem also being deployed i think it's it's quite interesting. Right. Yeah. So. That was, right. That was. Yeah. I'm just gonna gonna finish with future directions. So. Yeah, the embeddings um, here you can also use them where you want to jointly infer about visual features and semantics such as scene graph generation or uh, you know visual question answering where object detectors, image classifiers, and also natural language models are you know used in conjunction and used together. We believe that uh, providing semantic context with the help of the label hierarchy should improve the performance of these models. Um, another thing is another area of um, promising research could be optimizing in non-Euclidean space is um, we, we figured it's quite difficult and embedding especially two different types of objects. So you have your labels and images together compounds a problem. It would be interesting to see what kind of um, you know optimizer are better suited and if they need to be mathematically more accurate or just better at optimizing in highly non-convex landscapes. Uh, another thing is one could imagine starting the trade-off between returning more abstract but correct labels, then you know returning all the possible la labels. Like if you have four levels, returning all the like labels for all the levels, but being you know having some incorrect le uh, labels in that. Um, in that return value. And then the model's complexity to map the images from, uh, from you know, the, the representation learned by the CNN to the embedding space is another thing that could make these, uh, you know, methods really interesting. So yeah, that would be it from my side. Some nice illustrations for you. So these are uh, the hyperbolic cones projected in 2D. And yeah. That would be it from my side. Right. So I had I'm a open for question. Questions, which actually of course. Got, actually got, yeah. Uh, my question pretty much covered in the slide. 
So, so that that kind of a system for a question answer for a question call to the people or not call to the people or not. Uh, your audio was not completely hearable. Can you repeat again? Yeah, is it better now? Yeah, is it better now? Yeah. Okay. So um, this okay. is one curiosity so, um, in the undergrad space. I yeah. wonder, like, if I we try to implement we try the marginalization, the marginalization into a question answering problem, which has hierarchical data, which has a call for people. Sorry, does it what? Does it call for a paper? Is it novel enough to be a paper? Is it novel enough to be explored? I think. I think there is a uh, yeah yeah uh, Shambhali, I think there is a massive uh, echo from your side from your side can you just uh, type it in the just, chat maybe uh, type it in the chat maybe yeah there's a lot of echo yeah lot thank of you echo. ankit thank you very much for thank the time we joined later I think there's an echo from my side as well. I think. Right? Yeah, sir. Your voice is also echoing. Your voice is also echoing. Oh, okay. There's something going on. Okay. There's something. Okay. 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 Shambhavi, maybe you can just put it in the chat. Okay. Shambhavi, maybe you can just put it in the chat. I think I think I kind of got got her question. If Unless I misunderstood. So I think, yes, like the novelty part, there are two things about it. Of course, I have, like, yeah, I mean, it depends on the conference and what they are focusing on. There are some conferences that that are looking specifically for applications. So there is like WACV. It's a it's a more applications oriented conference. So I think if you have really cool results, they should be uh, they should be strong to you know publish in such venues. But also in general, I think uh, the part of publishing is it can be uh, quite tricky. But I personally believe that um, engineering research is also research. So if you are able to, you know, build something that may not be very novel, but just bringing things together from other places, but it has, it can be shown to have a really, you know, high impact in, you know, to common people or in general. To have a higher impact than you could you could think of, I think, I think it's also things that we as engineers or scientists we really need. That of yeah. course there is the research part of it, and of course there's a the point where you care more about you know implementing it and you know trying to get this research, get these results out in the hands of you know more and more people. So I think you cannot say one is more than the other. Of course, people might have different opinions about what they like more. But I think in general, there are two sides of the same coin. Yeah, Ankit, please uh, go through the chat. Maybe there Ankit, are a few questions please, in the chat. Go through the chat. Thank you, Ankit. Maybe echo is not uh, if echo is not a problem right now. Uh, the second question was that uh, in NLP, yes, embeddings are the approach to any classification problem or any problem in general. General, but for image data, if we are dealing with the hierarchical classification, do we have an alternative approach to embeddings? Well, if you have hierarchy, I think more recently, or well, at least for me, I have starting to see like the the graph neural networks being used a lot when you have this, uh, you know, interaction between different things. And I think it could also be interesting to see if you can, you can apply uh, like a graph neural network uh, where you have a hierarchy because of course in the hierarchy, you might have directional edges and you know you could use i could imagine using something like a graph neural network to uh, to try out and see if they help when you have the hierarchy other than what i showed you here and other things that are available online Hmm. Graph neural networks should definitely be tried. Uh, coming again to uh, the edges to you mentioned, uh, uh, edges on, in page number six of the paper, why were edges it as validation, 5% and test? Page number six. Yeah, so <clears throat> the thing is that when you're performing 
um, like when you're trying to learn, you would like to um, also classify whether edges are being, uh, you know, you, you don't want to overfit to it. You want to, have more general. so you would divide the edges into your normal train set as you would do for any data. So you would divide it into your, you know, train validation and test set. And the main idea is that you don't want to like have everything together because you want to measure performance, right? And we know that the edges are kind of related. So if you know that, you know, one expert concept, like for example, if you know it's an orange, you know, the orange is also a fruit, right? And you know that a fruit is, you know, it's, it's a thing, let's say. So you can kind of have this uh, transitive relation that you can, um, you can, you uh, can, you can understand when you see the edges and this is exactly why we want to split so we can actually tell how the representations are being learned. Uh, there's one more question from Rahul in the audience. Uh, Rahul, you can unmute yourself and ask Rahul in the audience. You can unmute yourself and ask Rahul in the audience. I guess there is an echo issue still. So uh, I guess there is an echo issue. Uh, is it okay? Uh, right. It okay? Go ahead. Uh, like uh, in this paper, you are mentioning about the hierarchy level classification, right? Uh, can you please specify the effectiveness in a single level, like binary uh, types of classification where we have area of interest and background? Or uh, there are any kind of... So, yeah. uh, uh, any kind of okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I just think? I just wanted to clarify. So do you, do you mean that there are only two labels that you have or when you, binary, or when you say two, you mean there are two levels? No, no, no. Only two labels like uh, foreground and background. Mm. Only two labels like uh, foreground and background. It's mm. what we have as an effectiveness. Yeah, in terms I mean, as an effectiveness in terms. Yeah, no, I, I think, I think there's of course one way to look at it when you have naturally occurring hierarchy. So in our case, it was, a naturally occurring hierarchy. The taxonomy tree is a hierarchy and we had labels exactly coming from this taxonomy tree. So it made sense to have this hierarchical method. On the other hand, it might not make, make very much sense where there is no hierarchy. So if you have, let's say if you're trying to segment the image, I'd say that maybe I do not see a direct hierarchy that is like, you know, a foreground and a background. I don't see hierarchy in that sense. I just see it as a more, you know, a simple, like complicated. Uh, at least that's what I think. Like, I don't see a hierarchy uh, in my intuition. I don't see a hierarchy. So I would not try to, you know, add a hierarchy just for the sake of it. So I would be more the, as a binary classification problem, as you rightly said. Uh, like in terms of embedding, is there any way? Like in terms of embedding, is there any way? Or is it like okay to so you, deal you, with the band? You like to use that? Or is it like okay to deal with the band? Uh, Ankit, maybe I, can I, you just I mute yourself? That. I think yes. Maybe, yes. Yeah. When he yeah. asked the question, I think because of this. Yeah, yeah. Now go ahead, Rahul. Uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of embedding, like, uh, like there are certain advantages of each method, right? So if the hierarchy level is perfectly fine with the multiple hierarchy, then at single level also, it can have some advantages. Or uh, is it the same as the other methods? Or, uh, is it the same as the other methods? No, I, I think, yes, of course, if you look at the level wise, we also have improvements only, even if you train it as a hierarchy and you look at level wise performance, there is an improvement in the performance compared to something we care about the hierarchy. But in our case, what, what I mean is that in our case, we had a hierarchy that was, you know, it was naturally evident. It came out of the data. But what I'm trying to say is that if you try to force a hierarchy, maybe you will not get the same results. That That's what I mean. If you see a hierarchy, it would be a good idea to use methods that it's a good idea because then you can, kind of, it's like a regularization because you know that there is a hierarchy. You would like to, the model to also know the hierarchy and behave accordingly. But if you force a hierarchy on something that there is no hierarchy on, maybe. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um,
I hope that kind of answers yes. your question. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Manish, did you have any question? I guess the answer. Oh. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think, uh, thank you very much, Ankit. Thank you very much for your time. I think uh, now, if any more questions, I think the audience members can reach out to you. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting presentation. Very, very, very interesting presentation. Uh, thank, thank you very much for having me. I, it was really, uh, really nice to, the to see that, uh, you know, people are interested in it and yeah. Thanks for having me again. Thank you very much, Ankit. Yeah, hopefully we'll see more publications from here. Thank you.